Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of Afghanistan by Afghans, where we get to converse and chat with uh, different Afghans coming from all aspects of uh, life and various, various fields. Uh, today, I'm very excited because I have an artist with me, an Afghan artist who is currently a gallery director at Wart Writer Art Gallery. And I said it right. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little twist. It's a little tongue twister, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very excited to be speaking with uh, Razal or Razal. Uh, uh, and um, we'll go get right into it. She has uh, done her MFA in the arts and has done an amazing number of art projects, including being a founding member of the Afghan Artists and Writers Association. That's also a longer name. I don't know if I got yes. that right, but um, we'll talk about all of that and about her recent uh, artwork and her permanent galleries and and uh, permanent artwork and all other stuff. Uh, right, all right here. So without further ado, thank you, Razajan. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Thank you for being here. So let's get started from uh, the beginning of. Mm -hmm. uh, the journey of yourself or your parents coming to the U.S. Yeah. Uh, and how did that all that started? Yeah, my parents, well, we all left in 81 during the Soviet invasion. And um, initially we went to Paris because my dad was able to, to get work through UNESCO as an architect. And that was kind of our pathway out of the country. And we were there for a couple of years. And then uh, we ended up in Washington, D.C., um, where my dad's sister was living at the time. And then um, my dad ended up getting a teaching position at Washington State University in the architecture department in Pullman, Washington, which is a very small college slash farm town in eastern Washington state. So that's where I grew up because um, I was also born in 81, so we left when I was a baby. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah. And so where did you spend kind of your childhood years? In Most Pullman. Washington? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and how was that? How was that growing up uh, there as an Afghan American? Or Yeah, it was interesting because I think, well, there were actually a few other Afghan families there, I think because of the university. Um, but I definitely, I definitely felt different in school, you know, like when Christmas time came and everyone's celebrating Christmas and you're not, or they they order pizza at school and it's pepperoni and you can't eat it because it's pork. You know, there's these things <laughs> right. that, you know, as a child, like, okay, like I'm different than the others. Um, but I think that. I, you know, I saw how many kids from other countries were getting picked on and I was like really afraid of that. And so I think very early on, I kind of learned how to camouflage and like stay out of the way, you know, like avoid getting, you know, drawing attention to myself. And I think it wasn't really until college that I kind of embraced more my, my Afghan identity and was like, more like felt at ease to explore that right yeah you said camouflage and i was like camouflage as an artist that must be very hard because <laughs> uh, and i noticed as i said that i noticed those two pieces of art behind you uh, are those yours by any chance you know what it's funny they're actually my partners it's okay. uh darth vader darth vader and, and r2d2 <laughs> awesome. okay. family of artists huh? that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Um, and, and so what inspired you to go into the arts? You know, I was always interested. Like, I remember from like age three, I was like always drawing and creative and like writing stories. So I think it was always an interest of mine. Um, in college, I went to school for art. And then I also ended up double majoring in international studies. And um I, I'm really happy that I did do that. I think it really like taught me a lot about the world and like the U.S.'s role in international relations and things like that. But I ended up getting like really jaded 
after studying all that and I was like, I don't want to do that. And I just continued with art. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's kind of like one of those things where I can't see myself not doing it. You know, it's definitely not the easiest profession, <laughs> but I just, I just do it because that's what I do. Right. I wonder if uh, in your family, Art, mm -hmm. what was the kind of the prominence or the role of art in your family? Did any of your family artists or were you yeah. exposed to Afghan art as a child? Yeah, that's a good question. My dad, I mentioned, he's an architect, so he's definitely creative. Um, but I think, you know, he he's seen architecture as different than like fine art because, you know, there's like... Uh, I don't know, like a more defined profession associated with it and like more stability and things like that. So he wasn't thrilled for me to study art in in college. Um, but, I, but I did and, and eventually he came around and has been very supportive of that. But he, he does have um, a real interest in visual arts. Like we always had different kinds of prints of paintings hanging around and we would go to art museums and things like that. So I think I did grow up um, in an environment where there was definitely an interest. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, architecture is definitely art. Just Yeah, uh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it's a lot of drafting is done through digital computers yeah. and stuff. But yeah. back in the day, I think everybody's just had, you know, hand drawn everything, right? Yeah. Did, yeah. Was he from that era where people had- Oh, drafting? definitely, oh, definitely, yeah. 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 So you've seen art at home. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and so after kind of from the international studies, did you go into studying international uh, studies and then kind of switch to art or were you pursuing both at the same time? Um, yeah, yeah, I was pursuing both at the same time. But then after graduating, um, I ended up doing graphic design work. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, transitioned into photography and video work right right and do you do i i saw the your photo and video pieces which we'll put links on so people can uh -huh. check out do you shoot these yourself as well usually yeah um because you know they're kind of like low budget productions but um the the last film hata penhan hidden line i had a talented cinematographer um drew and it was I, it was so great working with someone you know who could take care of that yeah that yeah. aspect of it i just watched that actually before this and it was beautiful it's, oh, thank uh, you. about the little girl uh yeah you could tell a little bit about what it is about but about a little girl kind of following <laughs> yeah i mean i guess you asked about how it was like growing up and i think this film speaks to that because it's about a young afghan-american girl who's trying to like navigate um just like being accepted into the larger afghan community and so you see her follow this black ribbon or sorry it's actually a green ribbon green ribbon yeah and then it slowly turns black um and then she's led to a group of masked figures and all the masks are in have farsi calligraphy with different status indicators like respect and modesty and instead of speaking words black ribbons are coming out of their mouth. So she's like okay. trying to get through them. And um, I think it's like very much about that negotiation of, of like acceptance and your own identity within mm -hmm. the larger community. That's great, yeah. And I'm sure inspired somewhat by your own childhood and experiences. Yeah, because I think like, you know, I you know, in school and everything, I was in a very American environment, English speaking, et cetera. And then we were also very removed from like a larger Afghan community because we were in a small town. And so it was like when we would go visit relatives and things like that, you know, there there was some judgment, like, why don't you speak Farsi or why don't you speak Farsi better? Or, you know, older cousins saying, oh, you're Amrikoyi or you're too mm -hmm. American or whatever. And um I think mm -hmm. like looking back, like as a kid, it was kind of scary. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and that kind of gets us to the question of identity, which we explore here a lot, actually, with all my guests, mm -hmm. kind of like, where do you kind of see your identity and or how has it developed over time? And how do you mm -hmm. identify? I mean, I do, I identify both as Afghan and American. As I mentioned, I think I didn't like embrace that. I think I was like afraid to embrace the Afghan side before because as I said it was sort of like survival just like wanting to fit in and things like that um but I think I mean I'm because I've lived in the U.S. pretty much my whole life I, I'm definitely more comfortable here I'm sure that if I somehow ended up in Afghanistan and was living there I you know it wouldn't feel <laughs> it would take some time definitely to get used to. So maybe in that regard, one could say I'm like, you know, more American or something, right. but right. it shifts, you know? It shifts, right, right. Yeah, I found it's, it's a spectrum almost, you know, kind of where yeah. we all lie and, uh, and it's a shifting spectrum. Um, so let's now talk a little bit about your artwork and your pieces. You've done a number of art pieces, uh, mostly, you know, mixing photo and video. Uh, I see. Uh, do you is that kind of your main primary mediums, or do you explore other ones? Uh, and and if so, if these are your mediums, why did you choose photo and video to be your tools? Yeah, I actually I really started to get into photo um, when the first time I went to Afghanistan, and I was like kind of documenting and but also visiting like sites of family importance, like. This was my uncle's old home, or this is the hospital where I was born. And um, so I was very much interested in storytelling. And this was also after 9-11. And I think I was very much impacted by the way the media was portraying Afghans and just these repeated reels of mm -hmm. um, Osama's bin Laden's training camps. And so... I wanted to use that same lens-based media that the news was using, like to tell my own stories about about Afghans and Afghanistan. And um, I ended up moving towards video because it just was like a more conducive way of telling stories because you can combine sound and movement and so many more elements. Right, right, right. Um, when did you did you start on the video photo right after? college you I know it took you kind some of time I think it was like I mean I think I guess photo like after college I started pretty much right after college and then I didn't get into video until I started pursuing my MFA which was a few years after that okay okay yeah Wonderful. yeah what what do you, what did you come out of with the MFA what was your takeaways from that you know it's mixed I think that I'm glad I did it because I think it helped me kind of like find my voice. Like I know uh, one instructor was saying that I was kind of like tiptoeing around the issues that were important to me, like identity. I wasn't just like feeling comfortable to just really, um, I don't know, I guess be honest okay. that I was speaking about that and about myself. Um, but I also think that there's kind of this cult, there can be this culture in, in art academia of like, I don't know, just a snobbiness or <laughs> I don't know, like it's almost cool. To, it's cool to criticize everything and it's uncool to just say that you like something. And I think I kind of had to unlearn some habits as well Yeah. after grad school. <laughs> Yeah, that's very accurate description. <laughs> yeah, that, and art world in general, you know, yeah. it doesn't stop at school, unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, so when, uh, a, when you know, kind of recently after what has happened in Afghanistan, you you've had a few pieces inspired by the situation as well. I think your latest one. Uh, can you kind of describe what was the inspiration behind your latest piece? And um, yeah, what yeah. led to it? Um, well, in August, 
So I mentioned I'm a member of the Afghan American Artists and Writers Association and various members um, have worked with different Afghan artists. And some of those artists reached out to us in August. Um, one in particular reached out to me who is in a previous exhibit of ours and um, wanted help getting out. And, you know, it kind of started as a fundraiser thinking, oh, maybe we can send him some money so that he can afford to leave. But it just snowballed because everything was getting so chaotic and uh, the rules and the opportunities and everything were changing very quickly. Um, so, I mean, that was from like August till November working with him. And I mean, we still are kind of working because he is out of the country now, but at, and is studying as a student, but doesn't know how to fund his second year of school. And so it's an ongoing thing, but um, that whole experience inspired a recent project and I'm, I'm calling it like a multi-chapter project because there's just so much that I experienced in that time, I can't really do it all in one. So um, the project is called Chilla 40 Years Later, and that title is inspired. So Chilla is like this like cycle of 40 days. Or So I was thinking about how crazy it was that it was almost exactly 40 years after we left the country, because we left in August too. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And then I also, and I was a baby. And then at this time, I also had a young daughter, a baby. And it was just, wow. it was this weird cycle. And um, it was also bizarre because, you know, even though I was a baby, I was like feeling kind of like this weird, like repetition of trauma happening. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the first like chapter or installment of that project is called Withdraw. And it was at ArtCore LA in Los Angeles. Um, and I like wrote the text transcripts between me and the artist on the walls. And there was also audio messages that we had exchanged. Um, and his audio messages were coming from this like single phone receiver that was hanging from the ceiling. And it was kind of this idea of like a life in limbo or like calling out for help. Um, and then there was also a two channel video projection that was showing kind of like all the like articles and things that he was sharing with me at the time, videos, but also that others were, because like in order to help him get out, I had to be in so many different like chat groups trying to find information. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to convey in this piece, like that overwhelm of information and the chaos and just try to put more of like a personal lens on that experience because a lot of people, they just saw the headlines and, you know, they might've been concerned, but I think it's different when you're reading the messages of someone or hearing mm -hmm. him say, you know, cause you can hear his messages get more and more frantic. Like he's like, oh, like the situation's getting really bad or, oh, the Taliban has come, you know, it's just. Right, oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. and, and you kind of showcase that progression in the art and then yeah. the late um, yeah yeah you you mentioned the 40 days uh, of mourning uh, yeah. traditionally i think the 40 days of mourning is that after somebody passes away you are to mourn for 40 days and, and then at the end of it you know you're supposed to move on yeah and hopefully yeah. you know there's been 40 years of mourning for <laughs> afghans i hope like there's an end in sight and and people can yeah. move on um because you know you can mourn forever i think that's the concept yeah. right is they're like okay you're allowed to mourn for 40 days, it's fine. But there comes a point when we need to move on. And yeah. to think that it's been 40 years that uh, families such as yours kind of uh, have been, you know, uh, moved from, from their homeland and all of that is, is kind of hard to think about, right? Uh, hopefully yeah. with, with no end in sight, that's kind of the, I think that's what you're saying in, in this last piece, you've kind of explored that as well, right? Kind of this concept of no end in sight or no hope. Because there's a lot of people who are being left behind who aren't necessarily did not work with the us aren't interpreters you know 40 million yeah, people we're talking about a very small percentage mm -hmm. of people who have been involved with the us and can now come out or other european countries but then there's 40 38 million people like what's going to happen to them right 
Um, yeah, and I wonder just, if this person is one of them. Yeah, it was a terrible thing to see because we had to submit these like vulnerability statements to these different groups that were helping. And it's like you sum up this person's life in two lines of why they're vulnerable. For example, they're an artist or they're an ethnic minority, etc. But then it's like, what about this widow who's blind and uneducated, doesn't speak English, doesn't have any connection with an NGO? Like, what makes her less valuable to evacuate than these other people? It's just that valuation system that was at play was really horrifying, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as you well, said, it's, it's like- at play, a, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, six months on, or still, yeah, it's uh, still at play. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as you said, like there's so many people there who are who are really in dire need of help and who are starving, and I mean, it's a real mm -hmm. like national catastrophe. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, with your uh, connections with through the organization, what has mm -hmm. been, I know you're a founding member of this organization. What kind of inspired you guys to start it? Um, and what activities have you guys been doing with the Afghan Artists and Writers Association? Yeah, um, the the two people who really started it were Sahar Maradi and Zora Saeed, who are both writers. Um, and they were doing various events, um, like poetry readings and film screenings. And then I participated in one of their exhibits and was so inspired by the organization that I joined. And um, so we do all sorts of public programming, workshops, exhibits, panel discussions, because like one of the, the goals of the group is to kind of provide a platform for like a critical discussion on Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just filing for our nonprofit status. And so okay. like, yeah, so we're gonna be a nonprofit any day soon and which will allow us to apply for funding and like hopefully expand our programs. Yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, mostly uh, writers and artists and, and uh, have they explored other art forms as well, like film and music and stuff? Oh like yeah, all, all the different types of all art forms. and also um, academics and activists as okay. well. Yeah, okay. Um, okay. and we have like different membership levels. Like we have a Slack group where people just want to connect with other Afghan creatives. They can do that. Or if they want to be more involved and like work on programming, they can do that as well. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and uh, membership to this organization is open. Mm -hmm. People can go on through the website and join. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, and even though it's like the Afghan American, like there's also Canadians, like we're not, <laughs> we yeah. don't have any preference or. <laughs> right. Maybe change to Afghan diaspora artists. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah there's a bunch of groups like that. So. Uh, now coming back to to you and your work, what are um, your some of the projects that uh, you want to explore? You uh -huh. know, given the recent situation, whether it's inspired by the situation in Afghanistan or not, what are you exploring right now as an artist? Yeah, I'm right now. I'm like working on expanding the Chilla project. So I mentioned there was that one chapter, and I'm um, applying for grants and working out like the different elements. Um, yeah. because there's so many elements of the experience. For example, I mentioned like it brought up a lot about my own family's experience of leaving. So I've been doing some interviews of family members and like actually learned some stuff that I didn't even know before about like how we left. Um, but I also want to like bring light to like the bureaucracy and paperwork, um, and just the like changing rules of the immigration system in the US. Mm -hmm. um, because I knew I knew our system wasn't great, but like really dealing with it closely, I feel like is actually quite cruel. And um, so definitely one of the chapters is going to be be dealing with that as well. Oh, that's wonderful. And how many chapters do you see this on or? <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. <continue>. <laughs> Multiple subjects is going to be maybe four or five. 
But you know, you okay. brought up a really good point about like ending the morning. Mm -hmm. Like that's like a good lesson for me too. Like, you know, like work through this project and then <laughs> move on. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great. well uh let's end the show with uh you mentioned about some stories you have learned about your family uh as yeah. a storyteller tell us what is one interesting story you have found out about your family's yeah. migration if you'd like to share yeah um well i learned that initially there was a possibility for my family to go to italy and what happened was that um in the neighborhood we were living in afghanistan in kabul Apparently there was this town diplomat who would go on runs and he would, he, like my dad saw him several times past the house. And then as the situation, you know, as he was like wanting to find a way out, he ended up um, stopping him on the street and talking to him and seeing if he could help. And the guy actually did offer to help. And, um, and so he, so he was able to provide some kind of letter and it was a little bit like it was bending the rules a little bit, but I think the Italian officials kind of like turned the a blind eye. But then in the end, he, he didn't go forward with that because like he would have had to go by himself first. And it was like unclear how and if the rest of the family could go. So that was a new story for me. And it was like, it just made me smile thinking about my dad, like watching out for this Italian runner. <laughs> And stopping him. <laughs> yeah, no, that's and and are the are the family any of the family still alive from that experience? And how are they feeling now, seeing this whole thing repeat twenty years later? Have you had? Yeah, any they are. They are thankfully, and I think it was really hard. And actually, um, when I did interview my mom and my dad, uh, my dad he said, "I don't." He was like, I don't want to talk about this. It just brings up all this old emotion. Like my, both my parents actually got very emotional, which is not common for them. They don't like, so, so that I, I didn't know that was there for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they were still, there was still love emotion from, you know, 40 years ago, even though they have a knife oh, yeah. here and are settled. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Unless it's resolved and tapped into and through perhaps mental health and such or, or time itself. Uh, I yeah. don't know how much healing it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's been for a lot of people, it has been very re-traumatizing. Yeah. Uh, who have kind of fled and have, have to see the same thing repeat 20 years later. Um, yeah. 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 That's been that's been wonderful. Um, well, I I. Thank you very much for uh, spending this time with us. I feel like uh, there's a lot more we can talk about, but uh, it's just, and I, and I feel like that with, with all my guests, because right, you start a conversation, you're like, oh, there's so many other conversations that needs to follow this. Um, yeah, so I thank, thank you very much and wish you a lot of luck in your uh, artistic endeavors. Thank you, it was great chatting with you. Thank you very much. And we hope to see more of uh, your art in the future. And uh, we'll put some links on the description. And for the audience, if you love this conversation, there's more to love about uh, listening to other conversations with our other guests. So please do check all the other conversations in the series out as well. And thank you again, Ghazal Thank you.